In this segment, we're going to talk about one of the practical how-tos of doing Montessori education. Whether you're doing it in a large school setting, a small school setting, a home school setting, a, a child care center, you've got to manage the materials. We've talked enough and, and seen enough of Montessori materials to know that there's a lot to manage. Now, no matter what approach you're taking, the more streamlined approach that I recommend of not having lots of extraneous things or a more buy anything you can, make everything you can, and store it as best you can approach, you're going to need to have a system or it's going to create problems. Especially if you're teaching at the lower elementary level, the materials that are required to beautifully and elegantly present the cultural subjects are extensive. This is the age group from age six to nine when the children are right in the middle of making the passage to abstraction. They still are very much in need of materials to help them to understand concepts abstract math concepts, abstract concepts of our universe, science concepts, things that are too small for the eye to see, things so large the eye can't even conceive them, the, the mind can't conceive them, much less the eye see them. That, those are the places where the materials are essential. And so if you are teaching children ages six to nine, you're going to have a lot of cultural materials that you need to manage. And that's one of the reasons that I'm doing this segment. So even if you're doing things in a pretty streamlined way, which I recommend, you're going to have to figure out how to manage the materials. Now there are three things that you're going to need to do if the materials are going to support you and the children in your your class or family's education rather than the materials managing you, which is what it can feel like if you have a lot. The first thing that you have to do is actually use them. Now, I am the first one to say I am guilty of buying books that I intended to make materials from, buying materials that I intended to put into shelf material form and out for the children that never made it there. And I also have had the experience of buying those things, having closed a school or a classroom, having made the materials because I couldn't bear to part with them because they were so beautiful, storing them away for many years and then teaching again and finding, well, at least I have them made this time and now they're available to use. So please don't think that I am unsympathetic to those of you who are Montessori collectors. I am very sympathetic and guilty of, of it myself. So. I want you to consider that there are three things you need to do with everything that you buy or save or collect for it to be appropriate for you to keep them. Number one is you have to use them. Now, I'm not saying that you must use them within the next three weeks if you are on a, a approximately academic year schedule to spend time over the summer holidays, perhaps a long winter holiday making materials is completely appropriate. But if you have things that you haven't used in three years or five years or 10 years, you probably are feeling the pressure of those things that aren't serving you or your students and you still have them and you still have to manage them. So number one, you need to use them. Second, you've got to have a way to store them. So even if you are not using a, a large number of materials, if you're going to clean the space, you have to be able to store them. If you are going to take the summer off or shift the nature of your program in the summer, it's probably going to be good to be able to store some things. And definitely, if you are teaching six to nine year olds or you have a lot of materials that you rotate or that you plan to rotate, you're going to have to have a way to store them when they're not out for the children's use. And that brings up the third thing, which is you've got to have a way of rotating them out. So even if you are on a streamlined schedule, if you have a smaller class, if you have a homeschool co-op, or especially if you have only your own children in a homeschool setting, you've got to have a system and a way for you to be able to put the materials away when no one's using them. If you have children of different ages and um, let's say you're uh, pouring preparation exercises, so dry pouring, pouring rice or beans or things like that, 
those you have no one in your family right now who's using those but you do plan to have more children or you have a baby who's not ready for them yet you've got to have a way to put those away where you know where they are so that when it's time for someone to use them again you can find them so you not only have to use store and rotate you need to have a system to make sure that that's what you're doing otherwise you're hoarding and Montessori hoarding is not a good thing. It's going to be a burden to you. It's not going to serve your class or your children. And so it's something to be avoided. So let's talk about each of those things one at a time. Now, kind of what comes before that is acquiring. So there are different ways that people tend to acquire Montessori materials. Probably one of the most common ones now that didn't even exist when I started in Montessori was downloading printables, free printables especially, from the internet, perhaps printing them off, possibly using lots and lots of color toner to do so, and then stuffing them away somewhere. Or, ideally, laminating them, cutting them out, putting them in the form to put them on the shelf and either properly storing them or putting them on the shelf for the children to use. So the things that you generate with your computer, either that you've made yourself or that you have purchased from those who sell electronic files of materials or the free printables that you can find all over the internet, that's number one. Number two would be the things that you that you purchase that are durable Montessori materials. So they've got, um, uh, they're not flat, let's, let's put it that way. So things like your sensorial materials, pink tower, knob cylinders, knobless cylinders, your math manipulatives, the, the golden bead material, stamp games, things like abacuses and, and bead frames that the children are using. All of those materials that you either buy, because typically you do buy them, you might occasionally get some donated to you, but typically you would buy them either new or used. They're in a little separate category because of their size and, and what it's necessary to store them. Anything that's flat, you can have a different system for storing than something that's gonna take up more space. And then the third thing that I'm going to, to consider is the things that you just either save or that kind of fall into a category in between the Montessori materials that you've purchased and the, the printables. So this might be things like baskets that you either buy used, buy new, uh, buy at the uh, thrift store, something like that. So I'm gonna call that the flat materials. So even if you purchase them and they're flat, you could consider them in there, you, your um, bulky, materials A, your bulky materials B, which include your containers, and then what I call art trash. <laughs> because there are things that you save with good benefit and that you might ask your parents to save with good benefit. There are certainly things that go beyond uh, collage. So maybe you do have some old macaroni that's too stale to eat, saving it for an art project is certainly appropriate. But there's all kinds of things like that that you can save. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a little bit of a guideline for acquiring those things, and then we're gonna talk briefly about using them, uh, storing them, and rotating them. So let's talk about a couple of these things. Now, um, this, I don't have the material in front of me, but you can kind of see from the packaging, dollar store find, five sets of fraction bars. So what this was is a little rectangular fraction set and it has both the, um, let's turn it right side up for this part, which is the main part. It has both the traditional or the um, uh, fraction where you've got one number on top of the other, regular fractions, and then the decimal fractions. So 0 0.5 and 1 half have the same color coding not a Montessori material, but if you have heard me talk about math before, you know that I do believe that the rectangular model of fractions, rectangular fraction manipulatives are, are very useful. I, I got that from Joan Cotter. She has some wonderful rectangular uh, fraction things, but this, is, this isn't a dollar, this is five for a dollar. So if you were to see something like that, I would say snap it up. It's very cheap, it's flat, 
and the likelihood that one of your children, one of your students might need it because it is a different kind of manipulative way that you could present a, a very solid concept that needs a lot of repetition, very, very worthwhile to do that. Now, let's look at some other things. What about that? Well, that's not a material. That's a beautiful Washika catalog, which is a lot of fun to look at. Um, probably not something you're going to make materials out of, but what about these things? Well, guess what? This is additional things that you need to store. So these aren't even materials. These are the things that you need to manage your school. So I've got a, a, a publication here, I've got a catalog here, and in the case of what I have here, these are some things that I've done. And now you can see one other reason why the manuals that I have are manuals and not albums. Why the charts to help you be able to review and see where you need to be in different areas are very small. So any time that you can go flat and you can go small, I would say you can be a little bit more um, loosey-goosey about acquiring things because the likelihood that you can organize them and store them and not have to worry about using them on their, yourselves or rotating them out too quickly is high. Now you might find something like this. It's a candy box, Susan. Why would I want that? Well, if your children have a rock collection or you have a rock collection, that would be something worthwhile to, to store. But this is exactly the kind of thing where I'm gonna say to you, oh, you look at it and you go, oh, I'll cover it with um, cardstock and, and then we can, maybe we'll even spray paint the inside so it looks nicer and I'll put little labels on it. Well, if you do that, you, you, you buy it, you get it at Christmas time, you do that next summer, you're on track. That's a, a very good use of something that would have just gotten thrown away. Reuse, very green concept. But I'm going to suggest that anything that you acquire like that, you need to have a system of saying, you know, I had the best intentions, didn't happen, it's done. And I'm gonna suggest two years. If you have things you haven't made into materials by two years, it's probably time to let them go. If you keep track of them, if you organize them into boxes so that you can go through and say, hey, you know, every two summers, I need to clear out the stuff that I haven't used, that's probably a good way to do it. If you're in community with other Montessori people, homeschool folks, whatever, maybe have a swap every summer so that you can switch out the things that you're not using. So that's one of the reasons that I suggest that you be very, very careful about what you acquire. Now, we talked about using, so that's the main thing that I'm going to say is if you haven't figured out a way to use it in two years, you need to have a system where it's gone. Let's talk about storing it. Those 3D things can be very, very bulky. They can be very, very tricky. If it is something that you're going to rotate out and in based on the children's need for it, and it's kind of based on whether you have someone of the age to use it, such as the pouring exercise that I um, suggested earlier, those basic things you probably need to have what I call an early year, mid-year, end of the year box system. So even if you don't pull it out for three years because you're a homeschooler and, and you, you have a child who's finished up with it, then when the little one is two, two and a half, you know it's ready to start pulling, time to start pulling out some of those three to six materials, where's the first place you're gonna look? You're gonna look in your beginning of the year boxes for the things that you're gonna pull out for that little one to use first. Middle of the year boxes would be coming next and end of the year boxes next. Now, what about things that you're gonna use every year? What about your Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah things? Because I would hope that you would be sharing those holidays with the children that you work with. Well, I'm gonna suggest that the best way to store those things is to have them in a December box. I found, particularly with the three to six classroom, if you have a beginning of the year box for cultural materials and things that are only out at the beginning of the year, no matter what ages you're, you're working with or whether you have a younger class or an older class, you have a beginning of the year box, you have a September, October, 
you have a November, December, you have a January, February, you have a March, April, and you have an end of the year box. Now, if you have a big school, maybe you've got more than one for each of those, but that's the easiest way I found to store those materials so you can rotate them out in a good way. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is if you've maybe seen other box systems, I've seen systems where you've got nine boxes you have to open once a month so that you can get everything you out need out for three different age groups, for six different cultural subjects. It's just too much. If everything you're likely to need is in boxes sorted by about a two month span because you know that's when they come out every year, your rotation is going to be so much easier then you do need a rotation system. You do need to have things labeled so that you can do that. And we'll go into that a little bit more in another episode. Well, this is Chris from Kodo Kids, and I've asked him to show us some of the products that he has that really help children to explore problem solving and the experiential side of science and art and some things like that. So Chris, show us what you've got. Yeah, well, we have the chalk spinner there. We have two different sizes, the larger floor model and the tabletop model. Basically, it's just a large spinning chalkboard. You can get a spinning board, you can draw all sorts of neat designs on the, on the top and on the sides with the chalkboard. And the kids learn about the movement of their hand versus the movement of the, of the campus. And so there's a lot of coordination involved in moving your hand in the right orientation to move the canvas to create the patterns that you want. That's the basic. Okay. And, and, and then you've got the small tabletop one that just works this, the same way. Same way. Okay, great. And show us what else you've got. Let's so see, over here we have the cozy cubby. Come on over here. <laughs> um, this is just a, a private space, a by yourself space, we call it. And the kids can climb in through the hole in front and just have time alone to read a book or just calm down. Okay. And then what's this? So here we have our slurry sheets. Basically, it's a series of tubes and slides and tunnels with connectors that hold them apart so the kids can take them apart and create whatever they want. And it's meant for outside in the sand and gravel area. Here we have pom-poms to demonstrate its use. And just pour them in and they shoot down on the kids. <laughs> That's great. Good way to keep your neighbors not being irritated with you. I don't think if you brought your gravel, they would have been so happy with that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. So, Joan, explain to us why it's so important to, to look at the fractions this way instead of with the pies that we've all been used to. With the pies, think about it. Are you comparing angles? Arts or area? <laughs> Comparing area, the size of the circle matters. Comparing angles, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, yeah. We never talk about that. Yeah, three angles. Oh, okay. With the linear model, uh, fractions go in a line. And that's the way we're generally taught to, to read linear. In fact, experts in visual literacy say we should not ask adults to compare two things in pies. And if you notice, even on the, pro the profit and loss statements, they put the numbers next to the segment of the circle. We don't do that for children. <laughs> now, but look at this. I've had fantastic success with this. Notice what, you know what this really means. This is one divided by two. One divided by three. One divided by four. We have an extra complication of teaching English-speaking children is that the term we name, we use to name fractions, we use the ordinal numbers. No, that's not done in every other language, except, of course, one-half, which sometimes you hear one-two. I was teaching a third-grade boy in special ed, and I had one last day with him and came out of the district into third grade, and I said, Michael, let's spend our last day doing fractions, because maybe in your next school district they will have done fractions. So what I did, I asked him questions. First, I had him put this together as a puzzle, which children love to do. And then I asked him, or I told him how to read the fractions, the one-third and the one-fourth and so on. Then I asked him, now which is more, one-half or one-third? One-fourth or one-fifth? One-sixth or one-seventh? We understood that pattern. Okay. And 
then we asked him how many boards make a hole? How many fists make? Incidentally, between my husband and myself, we have found seven adults, and I tell you how many eights are in a hole. One is a second grade teacher in California. And there's so many people that say they can't do fractions. In fact, there even was a time in which we said, why should we bother teaching fractions? Because we've got decimals. Fractions are merely division. And you can't do algebra without understanding them. How do you even do the area of a triangle? Base times the height divided by two. That's a fraction, folks. You need, you need your fractions. Now, let's ask some more questions here. What's, how many fourths make a half? How many six make a half? That's pretty easy. How many sevens make a half? Before you say you can't do it, think about it. Yes, you can. Of course, it's three and a half. What's half of a half? Very easy to answer. Which is more, four fifths or five sixths? Notice how easy it is to do on here. Eight, seven eighths or eight ninths? Try those with the pies, and your eyes get a lot of exercise. After asking that boy these kinds of questions, I asked him at the end of the 45 minutes, I said, now Michael, don't think you know everything there is to know about fractions, because we did not do something like one fourth plus one eighth. Michael, a child with learning disabilities, did it in his head. He said three eighths. Joan, that is wonderful. One of the things I love about your materials is that they teach the children to make the transition. They're good manipulatives, but they teach them to manipulate it in their head as well. Thank you so much. In this segment on phonics, I'm going to talk about phonetic readers. Now, we are very fortunate, you've heard me say that before, I'm sure, in the number of quality phonetic reading sets that are available. I've, you've probably also heard me say by this point that I certainly don't believe I have all the answers now, and I had even uh, fewer answers a few years back. And I've realized that one of the things that I included in my classroom in the past that I would prefer to avoid um, at this point are phonetic readers that have fantasy elements. And I, as I've said, I certainly didn't believe I had all the answers before, and I didn't even have the ability to ask the question about whether or not fantasy was a part of some of the phonetic readers I was using. Even if you have any animals doing things that animals don't normally do in a reader, that's fantasy. If you've got cats or rats doing things that cats and rats in the real world don't do, that is a fantasy element. I'm not going to say it's a deal breaker completely for phonetic readers, but with all of the options we have at this point, I think it's better to avoid that if we can. For those of you who may be more experienced with phonics than with Montessori education, just a, a quick review of the, the reasoning behind that, Dr. Montessori believed that fantasy was something that was better introduced with children who were able to understand it. Most children between the ages of three and five or three and six have a much harder time grasping the nature of what's real and what's not real. And so anything that we introduce to them t tends to be just taken in as if it is part of the same real world experience with all the other things that we present to them. And so when we have a cat exercising on a mat, as if they were in a yoga class or, or an exercise class, the child just sort of accepts that as if there are cats out there somewhere doing yoga. Now, the Facebook videos aside and, and things like that, you and I know that's not the reality. That's not the way that cats behave. But if a child isn't able to make that distinction, that's something that shouldn't be 
presented to them. They should be given that kind of material when they can clearly distinguish. And the reason being, children in that age group, one of their great tasks is to sort out the real from the unreal in the world, is just to understand what's going on around them. The world can be so confusing at that age that we don't want to add to the confusion. So this is the reason that we like to, to confine fantasy to, to later ages. And so the age that in a Montessori classroom, a child would be working with those very phonetically controlled readers, we would want to avoid fantasy. What other elements should a good phonetic reader have? Well, first and foremost, it should be exactly what I just mentioned. It should have a strongly and specifically controlled phonetic vocabulary. So if it is in early in a sequence of phonetic readers, it should predominantly have short vowel words of two, three, four letters that the child can decode having the content knowledge of just the basic consonant sounds and the short vowel sounds of the letters, of the vowels. So if the child is running into word after word after word that is not able to be sounded out, that's not a phonetic reader. Now, of course, we have to have a little, uh, we have to have some words I call them keywords, high frequency words that are not as easily decodable, uh, the, some of those, that the child will need to be given some extra help to learn before they are attempting to read the phonetic readers on their own. If you've done that appropriately, there should still be a fairly small set that they run across in those beginning books. So if you've got lots of those and, and uh, T-H-O-U-G-H, lots of words like that, it's not a phonetic reader. I found very recently in uh, mass, in big box stores, books that are clearly labeled as phonetic readers with um, cartoon characters and things that, that attract children's attention that aren't anything of the sort. I, I do give guidelines in, in our phonics program to, to help understand what a, a phonetic reader needs to, to be. I give some specific recommendations there, but it's something that you can make some good decisions on your own, especially with the ability to research the, the phonetic readers on the internet, make some good choices. If you're able to, to see the readers at other people's schools or at Montessori conferences or, or other venues, I encourage you to do that so that you can make good choices of phonetic readers that are going to best serve your beginning readers.